Welcome to Aging Better in Uncertain Times. I'm Gord Martineau, in studio, alongside Dr. Fabio Varlese. Here, we help you keep informed and up-to-date on the latest in science, medicine, and technology that helps us all age better in these uncertain times. You know, one of the beliefs when I was a resident in training was that we could have a completely pain-free journey through the hospital system. And I think promising patients, that does them a disservice. Pain also has a uh, evolutionary component. It helps you to protect yourself from, from injuring further if you have pain in a limb or pain in a part of your body. And so we've really moved away from promising a pain-free course. What we hope to do is keep the pain at a mi- at minimum mild to moderate. Thanks for joining us on our weekly guide into living a better, healthier life so we can all experience aging better in these uncertain times. Now, throughout this series, we're going to examine the best ways to prepare ourselves for the future. So what is the best advice for overall health? We're going to look at every aspect affecting your life. That means physical, mental, financial, nutritional, and medical. We'll cover all the bases. To do that, we'll supply you with high-value information from the leading experts in each field. And by that, I mean... I don't mean just everyday opinions. We're going to be introducing you to the leading experts in each field, men and women who have studied, worked, and who teach at the highest levels. You have questions, we have the answers. Joining me here in the studio, Dr. Fabio Varlesi, specialist in internal medicine and geriatric medicine. He's the vice president of medical affairs and chief of staff at Runnymede Hospital, staff specialist at Baycrest Health Services, and Dr. Varlesi, also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. We've also got with us today Dr. Hans Clark, Director of Pain Services at Toronto General Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Clark. Thanks so much, Gord. Pleasure to be here. Before we get to you, uh, Fabio, we're talking about getting away from opioids as a, as a way of, of you know, eliminating or dealing with pain management, but there's so many other aspects to it. And as we age, pain becomes more of an element in our lives, because as you age, it's likely you're going to encounter medical situations which require pain management. Indeed, uh, Gord. Uh, I have to say that uh, this is uh, my day-to-day focus. Mm -hmm. Every time I see a patient um, that is aging, uh, pain seems to always be in the list of the medical issues that they're uh, complaining about that they're, that is part of their, their history and their mm. comorbidities. And many times when I see them for the very first time, I see that many, many of the medications they're on could be in fact harming them rather than, than helping. And they could have been initiated for the purpose of managing their pain, but it could be that uh, they're having side effects uh, on at a cognitive level, predisposing to falls, and all sorts of other side effects on organ function. For example, even the benign non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs mm-hmm. like the ibuprofens of the world or the Advils sometimes could har- have heart implications, yeah. kidney implications, or even Tylenol uh, if there's a background of liver dysfunction, liver chronic liver disease, for example. Um, so. So we have to do a full review on their history. We have to look at all of these medications and perhaps uh, come up with a much more organic, holistic way of approaching their pain. And this is real because it really robs them of quality of life. And we need to control the pain on one side, but certainly decrease the chances of of, uh, side effects. Dr. Clark, you're director of pain management at Toronto General Hospital. So when people think hospital, the associated word that comes along with that is pain because they're going to a hospital or being treated in a hospital for something that is going to require a procedure which, which in all likelihood will encounter pain. So how do you approach the general idea of pain management? That's a great question, Gord. You know, as Dr. Valese said, it's very complicated, especially when you have more health-related conditions. And when we look at what we spend in Canada on chronic pain on an annual basis, it's about 36 to, you know, $60 billion. Mm-hmm. And so when people walk into a hospital, they have really two main concerns. One, am I going to make it to the other side? Am they going to get me out of this hospital? And two, how much pain am I going to have, you know, uh, throughout my journey, throughout the the institution? And I can tell you that there are multiple things that we often do. We, we explain what's going to happen. We try to give the patient some control in terms of how things are going to, to unfold. But ultimately, we're also responsible for their journey beyond the hospital. And, and that's where we've had some questions in terms of prescriptions and medications and things of that nature. But in general, uh, we, we really try to uh, 
hold the patient's hand regarding the journey and, and, and uh, make things as comfortable as possible. So you have authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications dealing with pain management. So I guess the issue is we want to get rid of opioids whenever possible. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but you want to, to lessen that, that reliance on opioids. So you look at alternatives. What kind of alternatives are you looking at? So, you know, it's such a hot topic right now when we talk about the opioid crisis. And I, I, and I feel for my older individuals who have osteoarthritis and have, you know, been on their uh, couple Percocets a day or something along mm-hmm. those lines that, that now are stuck in the middle of something that's bigger than just, uh, you know, do I or do I not take an opioid? We're talking about the whole fentanyl and the illicit crisis. And I think we all saw that big settlement this week of $8 billion by Purdue in terms of how... Um, uh, they, they did some nefarious things in terms of the opioid crisis. So there, there's a spectrum and there always is. There are patients that potentially can use it. And, and what are some of the alternatives? Well, you know, Dr. Verlazzi touched on uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories and that was hot during COVID in terms of whether it was safe or not uh, to consume these medications. And now we're looking at all of the typical uh, ranges of medications, whether you have an inflammatory pain, whether you have neuropathic pain, whether you have pain from that incision because you had surgery, there are different classes of medications. We all know we're sitting in the in the leading country in the world in terms of cannabis and cannabinoid-based me- based medications, and lots of people are turning to that. And so there's a huge research focus on all of these things, and in particular, the evolution of some of those cannabis-based products over the over the coming years. So cannabis, uh, the public perception on the part of many people who, you know, are, are maybe ignorant of the facts or, or the, the latest developments in cannabinoids is that in order to acquire cannabis as a treatment for their pain, they're going to have to talk to, you know, some criminal on the street corner with a dime bag and a gun. Uh, that is like Stone Age. But, you know, you, you don't want to embarrass people into saying, you know, you're, you're you got to wake up to the to the new reality but cannabinoid a lot of research is ongoing is it still are we still in the early stages however because a lot of the effectiveness or the efficacy has not been verified by studies and by practic- practicality so where are we with cannabis well, you know, Gord, I think we're we're definitely at the doorstep of putting aside this concept that all cannabis or cannabis-based medicine equals weed. And mm-hmm. we're stuck with this picture in our head for decades upon decades that as soon as you mention the word cannabis, somebody's smoking a joint. Right. And let's be clear, you know, we have one of the biggest compassion centers in the world on Church Street. HIV neuropathy in particular in the 80s was, you know, uh, started to be prescribed by physicians in Canada and the U.S. and that was pretty quickly shut down by the FBI. And you roll this forward several years, you start to realize that there have been a population of patients consuming cannabis. Now we're in a day and age where we have all of these companies, we have a country of, you know, hundreds of licensed producers producing products. And I want to start with kind of your your first subject that you have to go and uh, find, you know, the person on the street corner, anybody you talk to around you and just figure out what they're using. And people will tell you to use this for your rheumatoid arthritis and use this for sleep, etc. Well, we've now created a system where actually, if we can get more physicians engaged with figuring this out and find those companies that have done good R&D into some of these products that you can actually land in a place where it's used as a medicine. It doesn't have to be smoked. It can be consumed orally. It can be, you know, sprayed under your tongue. It can be potentially uh, used as an edible where some uh, some folks are doing or creams, et cetera. But we're just evolving and we are at the doorstep and, and finding some of those uh, companies and specific products. There's a couple of uh, studies ongoing that I, that I can share with you if you're interested, but uh, certainly we have lots of hope in terms of the next five to 10 years as to where this could go. We're all considered, we're all concerned, sorry, about, you know, health procedures. And, and you brought up a good point. You don't have to smoke a joint in order to get pain management from cannabis. Yeah. And so, Gord, we're just now, there's some publications coming out in the next few months looking at specific titration algorithms in terms of chronic pain, in terms of our older population that, you know, as as Dr. Verlazzi t- touched on early on, worried about falls and some of the side effects of these things. And, and there are different algorithms for those types of patients. And ultimately, you know, we've launched one of these uh, studies with uh, a portal with Shoppers Drug Mart. And, and I can tell you that you can, you, we have now a, a cohort of about 2,000 patients. We're looking at collecting and any physician in the country can uh, add their patient to this portal so that they can get a validated and a reliable strain of cannabis. Believe it or not, we're just at the stage where 
if what's on, you know, we can be certain that what's on the bottle matches what the patient is consuming. And we've created a partnership with a, a bunch of companies and, and have a third party lab that can test these products. And uh, it's, a, it's a medical cannabis real world evidence study. It has uh, specific products like sublingual sprays. There's a, there's a specific one by, I think, Avicana, a row product that has just been put on the market. That's a pretty new product uh, with a lot of R&D behind it. And there are various others on that platform that, that we can uh, you know, talk about and actually have a good look at do these products work long term. It's a six-month journey. And like you said, it is an individual journey. Figuring out the dose appropriate for each person is a trial and error process at this stage until mm-hmm. we get some of that data to start to head us down the road that all of the doctors want in terms of randomized controlled trials. We're not there yet, but the next five to 10 years are certainly going to be promising. Dr. Varlese, I mean, we're talking about pain management and, and you know, when you're talking to your patients uh, and, and the first thing they're going to ask you is how do I manage the pain for this? You know, because there's going to be pain associated with a procedure I'm going to undergo. What do you tell them? How do you how do you point them to to you know the right kind of pain management? Well, uh, first of all, um, a patient undergoing surgery could be coming with a pain history to start with at mm-hmm. their own baseline. They could be already on certain medications. Uh, some drugs need to be factored in um, before the surgery. There could be complications. Certain drugs can increase your chances of bleeding. Uh, and so uh, this is a review. It's an assessment that is done before getting into surgery. Um, but at the same time, if if pain is uh, a problem after surgery, which it usually is, you, you, most hospitals, um, because the management is done in the hospital setting, as we heard from Dr. Clark, there's pain teams that come uh, and deal with the acute setting of the after surgery and then upon discharge, pain usually tends to improve with time with mm-hmm. as healing uh, continues. And then sometimes there could be remnants of pain and pa- therefore patients get discharged on these drugs. And so, um, and then they get to see their family physician out in the community and that uh, further uh, gets managed. Um, and uh, again, some types of pain from surgery vanish completely as time goes by with the healing process. But as I mentioned before, as we age, pain syndromes, whether they're uh, muscle skeletal in nature or neuropathic in nature, Mm -hmm. um, patients go into their surgeries with a history, with pain medications, and this is duly uh, addressed uh, before and after the surgery. Dr. Clark, do you think that maybe we're... uh coddled a little bit too much when it comes to pain management? I mean, you know, you're going you're, you're, you're to have to withstand a certain level of pain. So, uh, you know, do, do you caution people about overdoing it when it comes to pain management? And, and you know, again, are we being coddled too much? And, and, and how do you decide what kind, what level of pain management to uh, prescribe for, to a patient? Or it's such a fantastic question. I can I can tell you that we have evolved. You know, one of the beliefs when I was a resident in training was that we could have a completely pain-free journey through the hospital system. And I think promising patients that does them a disservice. Pain also has a uh, evolutionary component. It helps you to protect yourself from from injuring further if you have pain in a limb or pain in a part of your body. And mm. so we've really moved away from promising a pain-free course. What we hope to do is keep the pain at a mo- at minimum mild to moderate. But you know, Dr. Malazi hit on a very important question. And guys, if we didn't do what we did and we weren't very good at what we did, we wouldn't still be in business. And you know, for eighty-five percent of the patients that come to the hospital, they do fantastically well. They go on, get back to their baseline and live a fantastic life for about 15%. And some of those are the people that Dr. Barlazzi talked about that come in already with a chronic pain syndrome or on specific medications. We don't always do a fantastic job. And that's where programs like our, you know, our transitional pain service that we've now got accolades for worldwide through UHN and Toronto General has been created. And so how do we find that population that is at higher risk for maybe worsening their pain problem or increasing their medications and, and help those folks after surgery and in into you know the the early months before we hand them back to to some of their family uh, practice physicians etc. And so there are those services out there. They're being increased. They're being built across the, the country in Vancouver, Calgary, Hamilton, the East Coast. And uh, I think that is a is a good addition to our healthcare system to support some of these folks that don't do as well after surgery. So I mean, you, you're going to tell them, hey, you know what? This is going to hurt. 
The question is how yeah. much. I don't know how much is going to hurt or, or you can expect this or that level of pain. So you're going to have to learn to deal with this, but there are ways of coping. So, you know, if it isn't cannabis or it isn't opioids, are there other alternatives like herbal medicines? Is there any uh, research or answers in that area? Let me tell you that there is there are so many areas that we can start to explore in terms of and you, you hit the nail on the headboard of how to cope with your pain or how to cope with your distress associates associated with your pain. Hmm. We use I'll tell you, we use clinical hypnosis. We use yoga. We use uh, we use other exercise programs. We do favor holistic approaches and specific uh, herbal remedies if patients are finding benefits from it. But we do have to, uh, you know, case a lot of this around research and evidence. Uh, Dr. Clark uh, uh, Fabio mentioned, you know, moving. Yes. This is a big issue when you've had a procedure, especially a surgery, that, that medical officials will tell you it's really important to get moving as quickly as you can after the procedure because the body reacts well to movement, correct? Absolutely. Uh, the rehabilitative process of the, um, of the after surgery is, is crucial. Um, as we age, though, uh, uh, that becomes uh, much more complicated. Um, elderly patients with a lot of comorbidities are much slower in that process, and it has to be measured. Um, um, but uh, absolutely crucial. And uh, studies do show that early mobilization uh, have uh, a, an impact on better outcomes in the after surgery, for sure. You know, one of the things we've, we've just published in March of this year, it's kind of got buried with COVID, is one of the first consensus recommendation guidelines for opioid prescribing post-procedures for individuals who aren't on opioids already or who aren't on, uh, who don't have a chronic pain condition. And I can tell you that this is a, a very hot topic. We have addressed it uh, in the medical system because, you know, really and truly, it's not the individual that's going to have these medications and per se get hooked on them. It's the excess medications that end up being uh, available for, you know, diversion or for others to get a hold of it and then and then be sold to the individuals or your teenagers taking them. And so I think that's what we can be mostly called on in terms of reducing the availability of these medications. For the most part, when you look at the number of patients that get hooked on their opioids, it's about 3%. Now, that sounds like a small number, but we do 220 million surgeries a year. Yeah. That's a lot of individuals, uh, you know, uh, on an annual basis. Very and significant so, number. You know, yeah. But it's not because they're hooked on their opioids. They also have a pain problem. And so really teasing this out and, and, and making the narrative one that makes more sense. So we also protect those patients that have pain is kind of my goal on the pain side. It's very easy to throw everything under the bus, but you know, what about that, you know, 75 year old that is taking only two of these pills a day to go have coffee with her friend at the coffee shop. I'm not sure we should be taking that away from somebody that has no history of anxiety or suicidal ideation that has been, uh, had a fantastic life and is using these things to cope. And that's why we have safe guidelines. And those safe guidelines pretty much tell you what that dose is. But once people start to creep over that, and one of the things we've never done in the past, Gord, is actually talk about where these things should stop. Mm. A pilot knows how to land the plane, and docs have not had those conversations about, if we start you on this, where is that limit? So that discussion is had up front, and people don't end up on 800 milligrams or 2,000 milligrams a day, which we have seen over the past couple of decades. Dr. Hans Clark, thank you so much for your time today, your insights, and, and, and for your discussion and the intelligent comments you've made. We, we really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, guys, and, uh, and happy to be here anytime. Some final thoughts now with Dr. Varlese's prescription to aging better. So, Fabio, we learned a great deal about alternatives, the studies into it, because the general consensus is we've got to get away from opioids. But also, people are, have to learn at some point to deal with their pain and, and the steps they take to do that. Indeed, Gord. Um, I think that the first step is always going to be go to your primary care physician, and if, if needed, definitely also be referred to a pain specialist. Um, as we age, um, our lives and our health become uh, certainly more complicated, and we tend to have a lot of comorbidities, mm -hmm. and we usually will n notice in our list of issues that pain is one of the big ones. You yeah. can come with pain medications, you may have to start them. That whole process of assessing a patient is very, very um, comprehensive. It should be. Um, and uh, the appropriate drug has to be started slowly. Uh, it has to, you know, um, be a trial and error approach. 
Um, but when a patient comes with all of uh, the medications that could be harmful, mm -hmm. like the opioids uh, or other drugs that can be harmful, uh, the physician has to really look at this and come up with a, a plan to perhaps taper the dangerous ones and come up with alternatives. Sometimes send a patient to um, you know, a pain center uh, to address the more complex forms of pain syndromes. But then, you know, it's also important to not just address pain, you know, with medications, um, but also with the no, what we call non-pharmacological approaches uh, to any medical problem. Yep. And in this particular case, we heard Dr. Clark talk about uh, studies on yoga, studies on um, hypnosis. There's also biofeedback. Um, you know, conducting a healthy lifestyle is extremely important. Uh, being uh, physically active, nutrition also plays a role. Um, but um, it, it's important to understand that uh, even depression and mood disorders uh, contribute to pain or pain threshold changes uh, with a mood syndrome. And so we need to address other medical problems uh, in a comprehensive way. There's, there's complexity, but it can be managed and the message should be there is hope there is a way to control pain and improve quality of life, especially during this time where medical cannabis is acquiring more and more the status of a medical-grade pharmaceutic. And as we wrap up today, please, folks, get a flu shot. The information is at myfluShot.ca. Questions about aging better can be emailed to info at agingbetter.ca or by visiting our website, agingbetter.ca. Aging Better in Uncertain Times is brought to you by Delos, Runnymede Health, Jewel 88.5, L'Oreal, La Roche-Posay, Vichy, Avicana, and Sanofi Pasteur, in part through an educational grant. Be sure to drop in for your next doctor's visit on Jewel 88.5, Sundays at 8.30 a.m. or at Jewel885.com. Until next time, I'm Gord Martineau with Dr. Fabio Varlese, along with producers Dominic Schulo and David Sirsta. Be well and stay safe.